Hello and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program. I'm John Bolden, President Emeritus of KQED and a member of the Board of Governors of the Commonwealth Club. We'd like to thank the club's Humanities Forum and the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit program. It's my pleasure to introduce John Avalon, senior political analyst at CNN and author of Lincoln and the Fight for Peace. John is an award-winning journalist who was previously serving as editor-in-chief and managing director of the Daily Beast. His latest book offers a powerful account of President Lincoln's vision for peace after the Civil War. A reminder to our audience, if you're with us here in San Francisco and you have a question, please write it down on one of the question cards. And if you're watching with us online, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube. John, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Honored to be here. Let me start off by asking you to give a very brief capsule version of Abraham Lincoln's vision for peace and reconstruction, and then we'll spend the rest of the hour probing that more deeply as you do in your book. But just a quick, what was his idea? Sure. L Lincoln's core insight is that if you don't win the peace, you don't really win the war. And that you know, there had never been a civil war on that scale before in human history. There's nothing Lincoln can refer to. There's no historical precedent or leadership he can look to. But he understands a few things. Democracies are different, and this was definitely a trial for democracy. People around the world were looking to America's failure expectantly. They said, we told you so. And then second, in a civil war, especially in a democracy, you could not simply pound your opponents into submission and salt the fields. You needed to find a way to learn to live together again. And so Lincoln, even in the middle of the war, is thinking about this question of how you win the peace. And his basic prescription, his basic formula is unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. But he understands that there are dimensions to winning a peace, right? You need to win the war, you need to secure the military gains, you need to have political reforms to remove the root causes of the war, you need economic expansion to reunite the nation with a sense of optimism about a shared future, and then cultural reintegration, which is going to take time. But he's thinking about it all throughout the war, even in the darkest days. And in, in his basic invention of a new style of leadership focusing on reconciliation, he is, is able to take a step back from the cycle of violence. His desire is to break that. And he understands that you got to be able to imagine a future that is not predetermined by the pain of the past and the leadership to execute that vision. And that's what he does, particularly in the last six weeks of his life, in his words and his actions. But tragically, he never got to implement that vision. And that's, that's where the, the book was un, untrodden ground when it came to Abraham Lincoln. In the introduction, you tell the story of his road to the presidency and how those experiences sort of shaped his approach to the war, to war and peace. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing story, and I really enjoyed the introduction as much as the rest of the book, because he's such an unlikely president. Yeah. I mean, he lost a Senate race in 1858, and two years later, he's the presidential candidate of the new Republican Party uh, and wins in a four-way race when he wasn't even on the ballot in the South. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> it, it is the most unlikely story. Um, and and as, as you say, I mean... Given that the country is a powder keg that looks like it can explode into civil war, Lincoln's ascension to the president in 1860 is beyond unlikely. Um, he's the leader of a new political party, the most successful third party in American history, the Republican Party, which begins, you know, is, the first meetings take place in 1854. So it is new. Uh, Lincoln is a one term congressman, he's got no executive experience. Never been a mayor, never been a governor, never run a business. He's got no military experience to speak of. He's been an honorary captain in a, in a, in the, during the Black Hawk War, and he jokes that the most blood, the most blood he saw was with getting in fights with mosquitoes. I mean, he is, by most, by most standards, he's completely ill-equipped to lead a great nation at this time. He is attacked, he is criticized, he is demonized, he is vilified. But what he has is character, and the capacity to grow. And those, those qualities, and the qualities of his basic personality, the empathy, honesty, humor, humility, that becomes the, the essence of his, of his leadership style and leadership strategy, what I call the politics of the golden rule. Um, but his rise is utterly unlikely. 
um, completely, I mean, people in his own cabinet thought he wasn't qualified to be president, but he, he shocked the world uh, and, and, and was able to lead the nation at this time of, of maximum crisis. And we, you know, we sometimes forget, because obviously, you know, history is not predetermined when you're living it in real time. Uh, that, that we acknowledge Lincoln as our greatest president, but he's bookended by two of our worst. And most of the qualities that make Lincoln great were incredibly rare in his time as well. Sure. You know, dis despite the fact that secessionists were not in the majority in the South, which is something I mm -hmm. learned from the book, the simple fact of his election seems to initiate the Civil War before he's even inaugurated. Yeah. Why was his election such a trigger? Well, um, at, at, at the risk of using the word triggering in any way, shape, or form, uh, <laughs> it, it, it absolutely, um, his election, the threat was, if you elect Abraham Lincoln from the Republican Party president, we will have secession, right? So it, it's a strategy that the South had been using for decades that, called aggressive defensiveness. That's the term that, uh, that a historian named Joanne Freeman uses in a book, Fields of Blood, where she, she accounts 70 acts of violence on the floor of Congress before the Civil War. And what the South had been doing was, was really getting increasingly isolated with slavery. And, and many people who were opposed to slavery, who didn't feel that the president had the power to abolish slavery, felt it was on a path to extinction, which is why the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Compromise propels Lincoln back into politics after being basically retired because all of a sudden, they see the path to slavery's expansion. And, and so the Republican Party is founded on the sort of the ashes of the Whig Party, which has been completely, uh, doesn't have any constant message on this key moral issue. It's a big tent party. It's a moderate progressive party. It is a party that concludes and contains everything from people who simply oppose slavery's expansion, like Lincoln, to people who want its abolition. Um, and Lincoln gets the nomination on the basis of his, his debates in the, in the ill-fated Senate race and his speeches nationally um, because he's from the West, the conventions in Chicago, and he's, uh, he's seen as more moderate and, and more honest, crucially, than some of the other candidates running. Um, but even then, you see in the press, I, I reprint a Courier and Ives print uh, about the, the attacks by the Democratic Party at the time, which is sort of the conservative populist party of the time. Right? They want to conserve slavery. They're very populist, Jackson era Democrats. And, and they've got a picture of Lincoln being led on a rail to the insane asylum, followed by a bunch of sort of what we would see as special interest radicals. Oh, that's right. Right? And, and, and it's ripped out of the headlines, right? I mean, there's a, you know, a, a, a feminist, uh, you know, proto-feminist, shall we say. There's a, a guy, uh, there's a drunk saying he wants the, the, the state to pay for alcohol and tobacco. Uh, there's two men holding hands saying they represent the free love element. There are people who say they want to abolish religion. I and mean, this is all before women or African-Americans have the right to vote. And yet all these specters are being being invoked to argue against the, the, the Republican Party at the time. And then by the time he's elected, they, the, they say, fine, you know, we will, they've already bought into the psychological preconditions of civil war, saying that if Lincoln is reelected, that itself will be seen as an assault on slavery and we will secede. And Lincoln's whole argument is, you know, not only from the first inaugural, we are not enemies, we are friends, we must be friends, right? We are not enemies, but also that he does not support the abolition of slavery at the outset. He merely opposes its expansion. Um, but it shows the danger of buying into those psychological preconditions of civil war, and the war erupts. Are we, are we correct, or am I correct in, in seeing echoes today of this? Uh, I particularly, there was a particular phrase in the book, elites posing as populists driven by the fear of demographic change. That sounds so much like now, and also the demonization of opponents, the violence on mm -hmm. the floor of Congress, um, how do, how do you relate that to you? What's you going you read that today? correctly. Um, I mean, uh, I, I believe in applied history. I believe in looking for useful wisdom. Uh, I believe, as Mark Twain said, that you know, history doesn't repeat, but sometimes it rhymes. And it's useful to listen for the rhymes, um, for the echoes of old arguments, uh, because you can kind of situate yourself. You can see where those things have been misused. I was very struck by the fact that a lot of the, uh, the, the Southerners pushing for secession for a long period of time tried to have disproportionate power in Congress beyond their numbers, that they really are afraid of demographic change. And in many cases, they are elites posing as populists. A comparatively small number of Southerners actually own slaves is one of the points I made. And Lincoln hoped there was a slumbering union sentiment, and there might have been. In most states, the secessionists didn't dare put secession to a popular vote. They did it in closed partisan conventions, 
also a direct echo of how politics get hijacked. Um, and, and so it's a cautionary tale. Um, not that you know, we're, we're likely to have another civil war for a million different reasons, from, from the absence of an issue like slavery to the fact that states don't have militias. But when, when you see people appealing to these tribal politics and you look at how people twist facts, right? I mean, so the Southerners convinced themselves that it was patriotic to support secession. They convinced themselves that they were, def they were fighting for liberty, constitutional liberty, when in fact they were fighting to preserve slavery. So it, it's, it's worth understanding the, the, the roots of these arguments and hear how they echo on without thinking for one second it's a perfect parallel, it's not. Right. Interesting, also like today, opponents refused to recognize the legitimacy of his election mm -hmm. and politics kind of became a, a matter of life and death. Yeah to people. That's the, that's the psychological condition for civil war, when you feel the result of an election is a matter of life or death. And, and of course, you know, there's a feedback loop you know, that, that, that accelerates that. But the, the mere fact of Lincoln's election was enough to spur civil war. I mean, and he's, he's trying to unite the nation, rhetorically and otherwise. And he's not going to compromise on his core principles. Very characteristic of Lincoln's leadership is he's not going to compromise on big goals, but he will you know, he is going to be flexible on all the details. Uh, and, and, and I think that's a very good leadership style. Um, but, but these folks were already hell-bent on secession. And, and the mere fact of his election, he was denied uh, being a legitimate president, threats of assassination and insurrection from the very start, uh, when he took his first inauguration. And, and he was essentially, as you said before, a nobody before his election. I mean, he was not known... Uh, particularly well yeah. either way. And so this nobody gets into the White House and did he transform into a great leader who changed the course of history while he was president or how, how did he? He, he showed enormous capacity for growth. As I said before, I mean, he, he has character and he has a capacity for growth. So he has no military experience to speak of, but he starts taking books out of the Congressional Library and develops a theory of the war. I mean, really a military theory about, you know, we have vast numbers, they are, they, they are better positioned in some respects in being more aggressive. We should be attacking in multiple places along the same line. He's pushing his generals to be more aggressive on the battlefield. That's a constant theme. He gets through, he fires five generals running the army before he settles on Ulysses S. Grant, who Nick's named providentially U.S. Grant is by his uh, soldiers is said to stand for unconditional surrender grant. But um, he has a capacity for growth. Um, he has a real political mandate. One of the political dynamics people ignore is that when the South secedes, all of a sudden the Southern Democrats who'd been blocking a lot of legislation are taken out of the equation. So Lincoln working with Republican supermajorities in effect in Congress are able to pass a lot of far reaching laws. Some of which in 1862, he's thinking about how you reunite the war, you know, things, uh, reunite the nation after the war. The Transcontinental Railroad, land-grant colleges, the Homestead Act. He wants to move the nation's attention and economy west as a way of taking attention away from the polarization of north-south. Um, but it's also a matter of character. He is constantly underestimated. He is often dismissed and demonized. Um, and it's the way he communicates. You know, he, he, he speaks in parables. He learns that from Aesop and, and the Bible and Shakespeare. He tells jokes constantly and stories as a means of communicating to average people. And his jokes are his best advertisement. They get reprinted in newspapers, even in the South. He's got this reputation for sort of backwoods common sense, but he's using it as a political tool to disarm people and to convince people. And, and even just on the most basic level, his belief in empathy, he believes in empathizing with people he disagrees with as a means of reasoning with them. Uh, and that's something that, you know, you, you don't see very often now and you, you didn't then. So it's the core alloys of his personality, empathy, honesty, humor, humility, and then this capacity to grow, which he does extraordinarily. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting that he was thinking so far ahead with the mm -hmm. railroad and the land grant colleges to the day after the war when the country would need to come back together. Yeah. How did he get... Uh, Congress to focus, even a Republican-controlled Congress, given there's a war going on and he's passing legislation for the future. It, it, it's, it's remarkable and it's about his faith in the past. You know, sometimes when we study history, there's a temptation. You know, there are a couple of temptations. One, you think of everything as predetermined. Obviously, it's not. Uh, second of all, um, you, you, you sort of get in a, a retrospective, almost nostalgic mindset. Lincoln is fascinated by the future. I mean, he's con directly and consciously trying to reconnect the change he's looking for. He's focusing on how to achieve sustainable change, 
right? He's a reconciler in a time of radicals and reactionaries. He is trying to figure out how you can move the nation forward, but not so far so fast that you create a backlash. So he's trying to connect, for example, as Gary Wills points out in his brilliant book, uh, Lincoln at Gettysburg, he's trying to connect the nation's principles to the Declaration of Independence. He's not trying to create a, a, a real break. Um, but he's also trying to lean into the future. You know, there's a whole conversation, and he's very concerned about the debt, um, even until his very last days. But we should stop construction on, on the, uh, the, the dome on Capitol Hill. And it, it seems like an easy place to save some money. But Lincoln says, absolutely not. If we stop working on completing the Capitol dome, it will send a message that we don't have confidence that we will win this war. It will look like we're hedging. And so, no, we go full speed ahead and we are going to work on that. We're going to focus on the future because it will send a message of confidence to the country, to the, our creditors, to people overseas. And that itself is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so he takes the second inaugural in sort of the shadow of that completed dome. It's very characteristic of his leadership style. He is always looking at the future. He's fascinated by the future. Hmm. So 19th century definitions of liberal, conservative, yeah. and moderate were very different than today. Yeah. Explain to us what, what, what those words meant then, and sort of where does Lincoln fall? Yeah, th this, is, this, is, this is one of the great questions because Lincoln and Washington and other iconic figures are, uh, you know, when we look back in the rearview mirror of history, we don't think about presidents usually in the context of their political parties. But if they're very popular, they try to get claimed by everybody for their own purposes. And so you need to try to, in all things history, understand them as they understood themselves or as their contemporaries understood them. I said before, the Republican Party is a startup third party. It's a moderate progressive party. The Democrats are really a conservative populist party to the extent they want to preserve the Constitution as it is. And they're sort of in the, still Andrew Jackson is, is the key political figure and he's a populist through and through and they're based in the South. If you look at the definitions of politics, and I did, a, I looked at a, 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 a Webster's Dictionary from 1828 to try to locate all this stuff. Liberal is about being open-minded. Right, it's, it's about being, that, that's the essence of, of the definition of liberal at the time. Moderate is closer to what we see now, which is, you know, you're, you're not a radical, you're not an extremist. You know, moderate figures of both uh, parties is one example. And conservative doesn't actually have as much of a political, explicitly political definition, but it's about keeping things the same, right? So understood by the definitions of the time, I think you can say a couple things. First of all, Lincoln is a moderate, who is trying to achieve liberal goals through moderate means. He's also of moderate temperament. We don't think about temperament enough, I think, in terms of rooting people's politics. But I think to some extent, politics are people projecting themselves out onto the world. And, and, and Lincoln is a man of moderate temperament. He does not go to extremes. He distrusts people who do. He does it, though, with a sort of twinkle in his eye, a sense of humor. That's that moral humility. You know, he, he, he combines moderation with moral courage, which I think is the the best political formulation. Uh, too often we don't see those things traveling together. But he never lets people think that moral courage entitles them to moral superiority. And, and, and that, that moral humility of, of trying to understand people where they are. He says, I'm not anti-South, I'm anti-secession and anti-slavery. They are just what we would be if we were in their position. You know, the, the part of the politics of the golden rule is that treating other people as you'd like to be treated. And it sounds trite, but it's profound. I mean, his opposition to slavery and the making the case is rooted in that. You know, <laughs> as, as I'm not a master, so I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. You know, I never knew a good thing that any man did not want for himself. And he also tried to extend that to people in the South. So I, I think he's a person of, of, of moderate temperament who combines political moderation with moral courage. And that is a recipe for creating sustainable change. What's interesting then is it seems like despite what you just said, he was criticized from all sides. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, and that's part of the you know, reality check, if you will, about, about, I think, understanding Lincoln as he was seen in the context of his time. You know, one of my favorite quotes in the book is from uh, Frederick Douglass. And it's, it's actually a speech he gives 10 years after the end of the war at the dedication of the Emancipation Monument in Washington, D.C., which has been the subject of some controversy lately. A replica of it was taken down in Boston. It was actually modeled on the, uh, the, the image that was on the abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, and it was paid for by formerly enslaved persons' donations. Frederick Douglass gives the keynote speech at the dedication with 
pre- then President Ulysses S. Grant, the whole Supreme Court there. And it's, it's a fascinating speech, um, and I recommend it. But one of the things he says, he, t- he addresses the fact that Lincoln was, was seen, he, he was not seen as a fellow traveler by, by the really committed abolitionists. He was seen as too moderate. Now, obviously, he's hated by, by you know, the, the reactionaries. But he says, fe- see, uh, Douglas says, seen from a genuine abolitionist ground, Lincoln could seem tardy, cool, and indifferent. But seen from the perspective of an American politician who was bound to consult the sentiments of his citizens, he was zealous, determined, and radical. Hmm. And that, I think, also speaks to the wise balance that he pursued. So given all this, how did he manage to get reelected ah. in the middle of the war? Well, you got to remember, I mean, not only has there's never been a civil war on the scale before, let alone in, in a democracy on the scale before, but um, there's never been an election held in the middle of the civil war. And so a lot of his aides came to him and they said, you know, you don't really need to worry about this reelection. There's a civil war going on right now. And he absolutely rejects that. And he says, we, we are honor bound to conduct an election because if we don't proceed with the election, then the Confederacy can already claim to have won. Um, a lot of people think he's going to lose, including Lincoln. They've lost some, some midterm uh, some, some midterm and early elections, as, as, as ones do. The, the death toll is rising. Democrats are running as you know, a party. They're going to bring about peace fast. Lincoln's point is, you know, no man wants peace more than I, but I'm unwilling to accept a peace, which, if it's given on terms too generous to the South, will not be long-lasting. Uh, he understands peace at any price is far too expensive. Um, but he does a couple things that are fascinating. So first of all, um, he rebrands the Republican Party the National Union Party, the National Unity Party, all right? So they're, it, they, it's, a, again, a big ten as you can get. He gets rid of his loyal but sort of distant Vice President uh, Hamlin, who's from Maine, has been living in Maine during most of the war, and replaces him with Andrew Johnson, who's a Democrat, who's a Southern Democrat. Now, this would prove to be the worst decision Lincoln ever made for, with, with tragic consequences for the country. But in the context of its time, it's pretty inspired. And, and here's why. I'll do an uncharacteristic brief defense of Andrew Johnson, or at least an explanation. Um, he's the only Southern senator who refused to secede with the state. That takes courage. Um, he, he says treason must be made odious. He's railing against the secessionists. He owns slaves at the beginning of the war, gets rid of them, becomes military governor of Tennessee. Lincoln knew him from his one term in Congress, took great comfort in that. But so they're able to get a Democrat on the ticket. They're going to balance the na- ticket, not West, Illinois was the West at the time, East, Maine, but Illinois, Tennessee, North, South, Republican, Democrat, and, uh, and it's a very powerful combination. That aided immeasurably by the fact that Sherman takes Atlanta, um, changes the political disposition in the country, uh, and, and he wins re-election by a larger margin and more votes than he won the first time around. So it's an enormous political victory with everything risked, because had he lost that election, I mean, we would have had the permanent partition of the Union, preservation of slavery, you know, a, a truly dark alternate history. But that political capital means that once that happens, he knows he's going to win the war. The South knows they're going to lose the war. And, and in addition to that sort of brilliant political move, he, he ends up with a guy he can't stand to be in the room with. Well, <laughs> there are two really important reasons for that, right? Um, Andrew Johnson infamously shows up drunk to the, second ino- to the inauguration. Um, this is, is mortifying for Lincoln, who's, who's a teetotaler, right? Um, and, and, and some people will say, well, Lincoln, you know, Johnson was fighting off typhus with whiskey, which is not a best practice on any, uh, any, anybody's account. Um, but that's gets get things off to a really bad start. I mean, Lincoln is, is sort of aghast and puts his head in his hands and then asks the guy running the inauguration festivities to make sure that Johnson isn't allowed to speak outside <laughs> to the public. Um, so that set things off in a, a really bad start. And then, you know, as you reference, I mean, Johnson actually tries to come up to the front to visit Lincoln, and he refuses to see him. And they have their last and perhaps first conversation in the second term, the day of Lincoln's assassination. Uh, and uh, Johnson is bizarrely never asked or recounts the contents of that conversation. But given the fact it occurs after the final cabinet meeting, he's explaining probably the, the, the principles of, 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 of Reconstruction. Um, but yeah, sh- sh- not showing up drunk at the inauguration doesn't create enough basis for trust. 
Who knew? And, and I guess I, what I didn't realize was the, the pure luck of the Atlanta victory. Well, because without that, I guess residue of design. But yes, in terms of the timing, it's it's I mean, there's no substitute for winning on the battlefield or, or in politics. That's that's one of the lessons. You know, you can't have a magnanimous peace if you don't decisively win. So this is a short question that's probably going to have a long answer. Oh, God. Both the first and second inaugural speeches, mm. very famous political, historical touchstones. How did he leverage each of those to set the agenda? He really seemed to use the two inaugural speeches to great effect. Yeah, that is a big question that uh, we, we could go deep on in a number of different ways, and I'll try to uh, constrain it. So first of all, you know, Lincoln had risen on the back of his debates with Douglas. They're being reprinted in the paper, his speech at Cooper Union. And Lincoln, again, was this Western figure. He shows up at you know, the Cooper Union speech in New York, and you know, he, he, he's rumpled, and, and everyone, when they meet Lincoln, always describes him as being like one of the ugliest people they've ever met. It's a weird recurring riff. But then he starts speaking, and something happens. He gets comfortable. But and nobody expected that first inaugural to be of the quality it is. And it's not as famous as the second inaugural, but it is, it is brilliant and it's worthwhile. It is the poetry of democracy. You know, we, 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 we must be friends, we must not be enemies. You know, though passion may have strained uh, the, the bonds of affection. Um, you know, and he speaks about the mystic chords of memory and the better angels of our nature. And it's really an appeal, particularly to the South. Uh, don't do this. Don't, don't do this. I, we do not need to have a civil war. We can find a way to reason together again. That doesn't mean I'm going to compromise my principles. Um, but of course, it's not heated. And, and the second inaugural is, is really almost a, a spiritual document. And I go very deep into the second inaugural. Um, it's the, you know, I, I, I do the telling of that day in the speech in the, in the entire first chapter of the book. What, what I think is misunderstood is it is a very religious address. He grows increasingly religious over the course of the war, um, partly due to the death of his son, Willie, um, and just the overwhelming pressure of, of being in office. One surreal detail is uh, he, he was seen reading the book of Job for comfort. He would emerge oddly cheerful. Uh, um, and, and I think it was because it was, a, you know, there had to be a plan. The speech is basically, uh, it quotes the Bible four times. It is an Old Testament speech for all the lot, but the last 70 of its 700 words. And the last paragraph is the turn, the famous last paragraph, which is also the last sentence, um, that is a, a quick turn towards the New Testament. It's New Testament leadership, and it's a roadmap for reconciliation. And it's a deep paragraph that most people know by heart, but with malice toward none, with charity for all, that magnanimity, the forgiveness with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, right? Which also acknowledges that no person can claim to exclusively know the will of God. If the Civil War is God's punishment for the original sin of slavery, the North and the South are being punished alike. There's no moral relativism, but nobody's get walking away free. Um, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. You know, to care for him shall have borne the battle and his widow and his orphan. To do all which may achieve and cherish and I love the cherish line that gets overlooked. A just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And, and that paragraph contains, I mean, it's sort of a Zen cone of, of, of American democracy, but it really is about reconciliation after civil war. It's about a spirit of radical forgiveness uh, and creating a horizon of reconciliation to steer the nation towards. And it's uh, brilliant in that he really set the agenda for what would be policy and legislation in a speech where he didn't talk about policy or legislation. That's right. The way politicians do now. He talked at a much higher level. Yes. Um, you note that he was a man of peace, but not a pacifist. Mm. Explain. Uh, well, I mean, he, he is temperamentally a man of peace. I mean, he, he is not a warrior. He's never been a military man. He is magnanimous uh, to the core of his being. Um, I mean, one of the things that really struck me is even in the middle of, of he, he didn't demonize people he disagreed with. Even in the middle of the war, one of the details I loved was in public and private, he called Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, Jeffy D. and Bobby Lee. <laughs> and I love about that is it's, it's slightly dismissive, right? 
But, but it also seems to recognize and send a message, tone comes from the top in any organization, that, you know, this is a familial fight. We're, we're, we're going to get through this. He's not going to build them up, make them monsters, as they were doing to him. Um, and, and so, you know, but at the same time, he is constantly urging his generals to be more aggressive on the battlefield. He writes blistering letters, some of which he never sends, a, a great, a great uh, you know, trick, a tool, um, you know, particularly when you know they, they don't pursue Lee after uh, the Gettysburg. Gettysburg yeah. um, so he's constantly saying, "Look, you know, we, we need to be incredibly aggressive." He oversees the writing of the first Rules of War with Francis Lieber, fascinating uh, little chapter which is newly relevant today. Uh, but he believes in being incredibly aggressive on the battlefield. Um, but interpersonally, he's a, he's a man of peace. And why did he consider unconditional surrender essential and would accept nothing less? So this is, this is actually one of the, 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 the key details. So writing in, um, he has two negotiations with Confederates, one um, on the River Queen in, um, in, in Virginia, Hampton Roads, and another in Richmond after the fall of Richmond. Uh, in both cases, he writes out in his own hand a piece of paper, his three indispensable conditions. And basically, these are the big three things he's going to insist upon. Everything else is negotiable. One is, well, as you'd expect, a resumption of, fe of, of federal authority. You know, the union must be respected, the Constitution must be respected, a renunciation of, of any alleged right to secession, which he doesn't believe exists, and says, you know, secession is the essence of anarchy, right? There can be no appeal from the ballot to the bullet. Something good for us to remember today. Second thing is an end to slavery for all time, right? He's already used his political capital to push through the 13th Amendment, but it's got to be ratified by the states. But one of the extraordinary things, if you go back and you look at the surrender terms at Appomattox, which are Grant taking dictation, really, from Lincoln on the River Queen, on the front porch at Petersburg, he, he talks, you know, it's almost unremarkable. It is assumed that slavery is over, right? I mean, the, the South ended up creating the thing they were most afraid of as often happens. The third is the really unexpected one that gets to the heart of your question. No ceasefire before surrender. Why? He's being offered ceasefires by the Confederates. They have some really ornate, surreal plans. One of the things they, they offer him on, on the boat, the River Queen, is let's have a, a, a temporary ceasefire and, and, and then we will reunite and invade Mexico together to dislodge the Emperor Maximilian. <laughs> and then we'll work on all the details. Um, I mean, this was like an idea that was really being discussed in, in the Senate, and Lincoln thought it was absurd. But he was never going to recognize the South as an independent entity because that would dignify the idea of secession. But the real reason he says we can't have a ceasefire before surrender, despite the fact he knows it would be popular, we can stop the bloodshed right now, is that he believes with, I think, rational reason, that if there is a ceasefire before surrender, that the political will will evaporate to end slavery. If the war ends, or the violence ends, before a complete surrender, that people won't feel a need, any urgency to ratify the 13th Amendment. And if you don't remove the root cause of the war, then you're just gonna guarantee the war will reignite later. And that's why hmm. he insists on unconditional surrender. T tell us a little more about the Hampton Roads Peace Conference and how it failed, but that sort of helped set the stage for the eventual peace. Well, it, it, this gets to the, the heart of it. I mean, it really fails because Lincoln refuses to any of their offers for ceasefire before surrender for the reasons I just explained. It's, it's a surreal uh, you know, conference. It's actually that negotiation is partly uh, re replicated in, in Spielberg's great movie Lincoln, where Daniel Day-Lewis really gets the, the accent right near as we can tell, which is a, a major triumph of its own, own respect. Um, because when I read it as a sort of a, a Kentucky, reedy Kentucky tenor, I couldn't figure out what that meant until I heard him do it, and he did it right. But, it, it, you know, it is this pivotal moment. It's that, you know, the president's leading a peace negotiation in the middle of a war directly. That's never happened before. And, and he turns down offers of, of, of a ceasefire for, for those reasons. And so it's, you know, it's regarded as, as a failure by some folks, but other people realize it's actually a flex. He's got all the political capital. He's not going to grant, and, 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 and he's not going to grant a ceasefire without unconditional surrender. He's not going to recognize the legitimacy or the independence of the South. Um, and it's absolutely the right thing to do. 
what was the importance of drafting black soldiers into the Union Army? Critical. And this is one of the things that has been underestimated and I think in, almost intentionally under, uh, written out of our history. Right? There are 180,000 black Union soldiers. Right? They come in in the wake of the Emancipation Proclamation and they change the course of the war on two levels. One, it's a massive infusion of reinforcements just on, the, on, on a practical you know, manpower level. But it also does more to dislodge some of the deeply held prejudices of white Union soldiers because all of a sudden they're fighting side by side with black soldiers or they see black regiments fighting for their freedom and it dislodges some of the innate racism that's inevitable, right? I mean, you know. And, and 25 black Union soldiers win the Medal of Honor. Um, we should be building monuments to those folks. They should be much better known. We see the, one of the, the 25th Corps of Black Regiment led by a, a, a German uh, immigrant, a 29-year-old German immigrant named Godfrey Weitzel, is one of the first regiments, really the leading regiment to enter Richmond after its fall. And, and they are sort of told aside, told to step aside so they don't get the glory. And, and they get written out of history. So, so the, these black regiments play an enormously important role, including until the end of the war when the Confederacy absurdly tries to sign a desperate last ditch effort offering any slaves who offer to fight for the Confederacy will be given their freedom, which is just as mind bending as it sounds. And one of, the, one of the Confederate generals protests against this and he says, well, we can't do that because if slaves make good soldiers, our entire theory is wrong. And he said, well, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, it, the, the importance of black soldiers in, in, in turning the tide of the war for, for the Union and for also beginning to really chip away at, at, at the deep-seated racism that exists societally cannot be overestimated, I think has been underestimated and written of our history, and I think we need to do a much better job elevating their role in our history. What was the relevance of the two weeks near the end of the war when Lincoln, away from Washington, away from his cabinet, spent those weeks at City Point? Yeah. Sort of how did that those two weeks seemed real important. They're incredibly important. So Lincoln, City Point, Virginia, uh, which has been renamed Hopewell, was the Union headquarters for basically the last nine months of the war. It was a um, kind of a sleepy hamlet, actually south of Richmond, part of the siege of Petersburg, which was key. As I think we're, we're sort of remembering in, in the context of Russia and Ukraine, there's a lot of war that's actually operations and logistics. And, and so the key to Petersburg was, if you could take that, you would isolate Richmond. You'd take the, the supply lines would be basically cut. So Grant set up there, in, and it's a startup city. It's a massive port. And, and Lincoln has been re-inaugurated and is exhausted, not only through overwork, but also with everyone coming and asking him for jobs. He's, he's, he's starting to go to German operas to be alone for three hours. He's like, you know, he's really getting desperate. And, and Grant suggests, you know, why don't you come down and, and visit? And, and Lincoln, like, jumps at the opportunity. He wants to get out of Washington. He wants to be on the front lines, but there's a strategic reason for this as well. He thinks if he's there, it will add to the urgency to end the war soon. And so he goes down with Mary and with their 12-year-old son, Tad. Um, and he spends more than two weeks on the front lines. And he meets with his generals on the River Queen. That famous painting, The Peacemakers, that hangs in the White House, is a very faithful representation of a meeting he has March 29th, 1865, uh, with uh, General Sherman, Grant, and Admiral Porter, uh, where he's, you know, and I, I go into great detail about the meeting, he's, he, he says, always, oh, you know, give them the most liberal and honorable terms, meaning the rank and file Southerners. You know, we want them to you know, give them their guns to go home and shoot crows with and their, their horses to plow their fields with. We want them to return to the laws. He wants accountability and not a resumption of privilege for the, the, the Confederates who should have known better. Um, but he is there transmitting that message to his generals over and over. He is seeing fighting on the front lines. He is meeting wounded soldiers, captured Confederates. And, and there's, a, there's a great story um, that I think typifies Lincoln's leadership as a peacemaker, where he tours the, what's known as the Depot Field Hospital. And it's a state-of-the-art hospital for its time. And he, it, it's hundreds and hundreds of beds. And he goes, and, and as presidents do at Walter Reed today, he goes and introduces himself to the wounded soldiers. And he talks to them. 
and he asked them their name and their story. And Lincoln is, is overcome with, with emotion when he sees the wounds and the amputations that were rampant at the time and is horrified by the cost of the war. And, and he's getting ready to leave after doing this for hours. And he sees a small tent out back. And he asks the surgeon who's traveling around with, who's kind of an imperious guy trying to impress the president as people do, he says, what's that back there? And the surgeon says, oh, Mr. President, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to go there. Those are just wounded rebel soldiers. And Lincoln straightens up and says, that's exactly where I do need to go. And he goes back and he shakes all the Confederate wounded hands and he introduce, introduces themselves to him. And you hear in their recollections even decades later what impression it made that they were overcome with emotion. Some of them broke down because they realized that they'd been fighting for a lie that he was a good man and a decent man who wanted to reunite the nation. One of them said, the second he started speaking to me, I knew I was whipped. <laughs> Tell us about his relationship with the latest technology. He seems to spend a lot of time in telegraph offices. Yeah. The way we spend a lot of time with smartphones. He seems to have that, <laughs> that edge. Well, it, yeah, it, it's slightly less isolating, <laughs> um, but only slightly. Yeah, Lincoln, as I said, is, is fascinated by the future. He's the only president who's got a patent, um, and he loves the telegraph um, because it really is a marvel, right? I mean, they're able to transfer you know, their, these electric messages. And he spends a lot of time hanging out in the telegraph office, both in Washington at the War Department and at City Point. He enjoys it. He's getting the latest information. He's getting his sort of trade stories with, with you know, the, 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 the junior op telegraph officers. It's, you know, he can sort of work on his speeches, but be alone, but have company when he wants to. Um, and and he's, it's just a reminder that Lincoln is really fascinated by, by, by new technology. He's fascinated by the future. And so more often than not, he can be found kicking back in the telegraph office. So six weeks after his second inaugural, mm -hmm. he gives his last speech marking the end of the Civil War. How did he define Reconstruction in that speech? Yeah, um, this is, and, and, and there's a great book, uh, Lincoln's Last Speech by Louis Mazur that is only about this speech, but it's basically the speech that everybody thinks is gonna be the big triumphalist, we won the war speech. It's on the grounds of the White House. The, you know, Lee, Lee has surrendered at Appomattox, um, the Confederate you know, cabinet's on the run, uh, and everyone comes to the White House thinking they're gonna get a big barn burner, you know, we won the war triumphalist speech. And Lincoln doesn't do that. He does it in the first couple paragraphs. But instead, it's a, it's a very detailed, almost legalistic speech about his vision for Reconstruction, which is a, a decided term uh, as opposed to restoration, which is what conservatives at the time wanted, a restoration of the planter class. He's not gonna have that. He also is setting himself up to fight with the radicals in his own party and cabinet, the radical Republicans who wanna rip the South up from its roots entirely. And he expresses a, a characteristically sort of practical, non-ideological vision of Reconstruction. He says it should be done state by state. It's gonna have a different tone and temper in each state. Um, that's as it should be because we wanna get buy-in. We need to make the ratification of the 13th Amendment to end slavery a condition for re, re entering the Union. Um, and we should know that, you know, we need to treat these people like men. If you, if you are a member of a court, Congress, leading Confederate general, you shouldn't be able to reclaim your power and run for office. But otherwise, you know, we're not gonna be vindictive um, because we want to, 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 to reunite the nation as long as these basic, you know, uh, things are done like ending, uh, like ending slavery and the state constitutions renouncing slavery. So, you know, people didn't really know what to expect. He also, in the final speech, finally says that it is his hope that if he's gonna show amnesty for Confederate rank and file, that, uh, that we would begin moving towards uh, voting rights uh, for African-Americans, beginning with veterans, and he says, the very intelligent. Um, and he's explicitly his, his policy written in letters around the time, uh, and even a year or two before, where he says it's his, it's his hope and belief that the blacks and whites will, in the South in particular, will gradually live themselves out of their old relation with each other. Um, but it is a, once he says that comment about black voting rights, John Wilkes Booth is in the crowd and he turns to his colleague, Lewis Powell, encourages him to shoot the president who's in the second floor window. And um, Powell refuses and uh, Booth says, uh, that's the last speech he'll ever give. Uh, and it was. 
And it seems like after that, the former Confederates and the abolitionists and the Democrats and the Republicans all sort of dug their heels in after Lincoln was assassinated and then made some appalling political compromises. Mm. How did his vision of Reconstruction fall apart? Well, his vision of Reconstruction is predicated on the idea of unconditional surrender being followed by a magnanimous peace. And there really was a spirit of magnanimity. You can see it in the writings around that time and public and private people really had bought into Lincoln's idea that we must not be, you know, we must be friends, not enemies. We must not behave magnanimous in peace. We're gonna lift, lift our, our former opponents back up. And once Lincoln is assassinated, um, it obviously sends the country careening off in a very different course. That, that cycle of violence and vengeance is reignited. Um, and, and that's precisely what Lincoln did not want. So Johnson, who pe the radical Republicans thought they were gonna get a hero and a champion in Johnson, boy did they, misunderst they uh, you know, misunderestimated that, so to speak. Um, Johnson is enormously vindictive. He's the opposite of Lincoln when it comes to character. He is erratic, he is ill-tempered. Uh, I found a quote from the Atlantic Magazine that describes him as being egotistic to the point of mental disease. Um, <laughs> He, he pulls the black troops from the South. He's granting amnesty to anyone who applies. Um, he, he is acquiescing on the creation of these black codes, which are laws that were put in place in, in I was stunned to find this, in the late summer, early fall of 1865, where basically ex-Confederates were taking control of state capitals and saying, look, we have to accept the end of slavery, but it doesn't mean we need to accept equality. And they pass a series of laws that are basically slavery without the chains. And Johnson acquiesces to that, um, partly because he is like profoundly racist in his own right. Um, and uh, he's actually obsessed with class resentment, um, not racial reconciliation. And that in turn, because uh, he, then he starts vetoing civil the Civil Rights Bill, he dismantles the Freedmen's Bureau, which was a very far-sighted sort of public-private initiative to deal with refugees in the wake of the South and to bring ex-slaves towards self-sufficiency. Uh, he dismantles that. And then the radical Republicans, you know, get, get their back up and bring troops back into the South to try to impeach Andrew Johnson. And the country just, you know, is, is, is on a pendulum swing in that crucial window where there could have been real reconciliation and, and, a, and a, a progressive, sustainable progress towards dealing, healing with some of those divisions is lost. And, and America learns what it means to lose a peace. Yeah. And it's interesting that, I, I guess we should have known this, but, but some of the data in your book mm -hmm. that slaves far outnumbered white residents in the South. Oh yeah, uh, and that's the demographic panic. And so after emancipation, black citizens far outnumbered white citizens, which obviously drove a lot of this. Talk about how that drove the birth of the Ku Klux Klan and the Redeemers oh, God. in that time. So. One of the things Lincoln's worried about, and he says this in his meetings with his generals, is we cannot allow there to be, we need to make sure we establish law and order. We need to really sustain and secure the military gains we make, because if there's a vacuum, that will be replaced with vigilantism, which is almost precisely what happens. The Ku Klux Klan begins as a, a, a social club for ex-Confederate veterans in uh, Pulaski, uh, Tennessee, uh, in Christmas Eve, 1865. Uh, very quickly, it becomes a savage force for white terror designed to intimidate uh, local black elected leaders in the South, uh, black families from you know, exercising their rights. It, it is a reminder that you know, when we talk about voter intimidation and voter suppression and election subversion, the entire story of reconstruction and resistance to multiracial democracy and majoritarian democracy is deeply embedded in, in our country. And you know, we, we can't ignore that history. Um, you know, what's instructive and useful is that while the first incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan uh, ends up really having, you know, in, in, enacting enormous violence against black elected officials in the South and families, um, Ulysses S. Grant, as president, to his credit, gets us back on the Lincoln path briefly. He goes to Congress directly and lobbies for the passage of the Enforcement Act, the Anti-KKK Enforcement Act, which gives him the power to, to, to take on the Klan. And then he has the wisdom in a very Lincolnian streak to have a Southern attorney general named Amos Ackerman oversee the implementation of the law, which makes it just a little bit more difficult to say this was, you know, you know Yankee imperialism. And, um, and, and they, but they also pursue Lincoln's path in that they, 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 you know, the rank and file are allowed to basically disperse as long as they turn witness against the, the, the leadership and they all spend like eight, 10 years in, in a prison near Albany, New York. And, um, you know, in the first incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan, 
basically disappears. Now, there are other white vigilante groups, but it doesn't reemerge till the 1920s in a, new, in a new incarnation entirely. So that's worth looking at how you deal with extremist groups. Grant's getting, deserving more credit than he gets for bringing us back in the Lincoln path. Um, but then the whole thing ends up being you know, squandered by the, uh, the, the sort of corrupt bargain after the 1876 election, where Republicans, it, it, it's the first time that you know, someone wins the popular vote and doesn't get the presidency. Republicans do a bargain that basically says, we'll pull troops in the South and end Reconstruction if you give us four more years of power as president for Rutherford B. Hayes. Um, and the Redeemers start to gain power, Republicans in the South, as you mentioned. The Redeemers, it's fascinating because they are arguing that we should be cutting taxes and cutting funding uh, for the South at a time when the South desperately needs investment to rebuild. The region's been devastated. Um, and already at this point, people are, and some people in the South are getting nostalgic about Lincoln. Not everybody, to be sure, but they're saying, you know, he was actually the best friend we could have had because he would have tried to rebuild. They're arguing to not. Uh, basically, they want to cut the taxes and cut the spending in large part so they can effectively defund integrated inst public institutions. I mean, it begins there. And, and the impact over the next 25 years in the courts, ex-Confederates serving on the courts, civil rights laws overturned, um, key, key decisions, and then state constitutions being rewritten. So that in, in 1900, 1900, there are 180,000 Sure. Yes, 180,000 registered black voters in the state of Alabama. Two years later, there are 3,000. So the, the study of Reconstruction is, is absolutely critical to, I think, who we are as a country and understanding it. Not, not in a way that, I mean, I think we're the greatest country in the history of the world, but we need to confront the good, the bad, and the ugly in our history. And, and, and to learn from those, those lessons. Um, because progress is not inevitable. You can get constitutional amendments passed, three of them. And they don't mean anything if they're not enforced on a state level. No. Yeah, it's interesting. Lincoln's version of Reconstruction was so uplifting, and yet now when we look back, when you use the term Reconstruction in the 21st century, it's a bad thing. Reconstruction was a bad time, even though the intent of Reconstruction was obviously well, good. And, and the history of Reconstruction was rewritten with Birth of a Nation, uh, and, and, I mean, you know, there was a whole history that basically said the villains of Reconstruction were, were the Republicans. Um, so, you know, that colored, I think, education and understanding of, of Reconstruction for a long time. So this is another longish two-part question. Okay. So Lincoln's vision for peace and reconciliation and his plan for Reconstruction, what was the impact of that on Woodrow Wilson at the end of World War I and then Harry Truman at the end of World War II. So this is the unexpected twist in the book uh, that, that I, I love and thank you for bringing it. So I, I, in, in my last book on Washington's Farewell and this one, I like to dive into the afterlife of an idea, right? What, what are the echoes? What are its impacts? And so you look at Lincoln's prescription for how you win a peace, unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. And you look at World War I and World War II. Woodrow Wilson is the first president from the South since the Civil War. He is actually born in Virginia, raised in Georgia. His dad is actually a Presbyterian, uh, a Presbyterian minister who writes a fairly well-known pamphlet at the time doing a biblical defense of slavery. He's a progressive, um, but he has the scars of growing up in a state that lost a war. And, um, you know, his background has not a little to do with why he resegregates the federal government to his eternal discredit. But when he gets pulled into foreign affairs, which he doesn't want to do, he gives a speech to Congress in which he says, look, we want a peace without victory, a peace among equals. So you can kind of see the scars of having grown up and having lost the war. America gets in the First World War. It's decisive at turning the tide. And Lincoln, or rather, uh, Wilson does precisely the opposite of the Lincoln prescription. We have a ceasefire before surrender, and then we don't have a magnanimous peace. Armistice occurs, a ceasefire, before the Germans have ever had a single allied troop on their soil. They don't really accept defeat. We spend the next several months negotiating at Versailles, and the Germans don't think they should be punished at all. They don't think they should accept responsibility. The Allies want a very vindictive vision of, uh, of, of peace because they need to pay for all the destruction that's been wrought on them. So you get reparations. 
And you get the worst of all worlds. You get punishing reparations that Germany can't pay, and you don't have the political will to enforce the, the, the terms of, of, of the peace. So, I mean, Versailles is, is a shorthand disaster, and a lot of people knew it at the time. They said, this isn't a peace treaty. This is a ceasefire for 20 years. Um, and they were right. So by not pursuing the Lincoln path, getting it precisely wrong is one way of understanding the failure of Versailles. Now, the, the second World War generation applies it more faithfully and intentionally. And, and here's what's fascinating. Remember, the second world generation is, is they're the grandchildren of the Civil War. The Civil War is very much real history to them, as, as were, I mean, you know, the, the, the impact on, on the big three negotiating at Versailles. But think about what Harry Truman, well, let me back up. FDR, uh, at the outset of the war, says, this time we're going to win the peace. He and Churchill have an official policy of unconditional surrender. And when asked to explain that, FDR goes on this long jaunt, sort of telling a story about the surrender at Appomattox, right? Interestingly, his, his press secretary is, is Stephen Early, who's a descendant of the Confederate General Jubal Early, but just a sense of how, you know, sort of mixed up and, and integrated everything had become again. Um, when Harry Truman takes over, it's about a magnanimous peace, right? He, and he, he recollects, he said, I don't want hatred and vengeance to be our generation's gift to the future. I remember how much my grandparents hated the Yankee red legs in Missouri. His mother, by the way, refuses to sleep in the Lincoln bedroom. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is personal. Um, but you think about what, um, you know, MacArthur, who's the actually son of a, of a Union general, goes in and, and in the occupation of Japan, um, they, he's constantly drawing on the legacy of Lincoln. There's actually a bust of Lincoln in Hirohito's office. Lincoln had been lionized in Japan before the war. So l the Lincoln story becomes a real touchstone for reintegrating and, and democratizing Japan. In Germany, I found a quote from uh, the German general, the American general Lucius Clay, who does the occupation of Germany. He's a three -term, son of a three-term Georgia senator, grows up to make in Georgia three decades uh, after the war. And somebody asks him, what guided your decisions? in the occupation of Germany. And this is really where the seed of the idea of the book began. And he said, I tried to think what Abraham Lincoln would have done for the South if he had lived. Which is so profound to me and so unexpected that it began the process that became this book. But finally and most importantly, the Marshall Plan, which we'll, we'll celebrate the you know, 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. Um, you think about the way that Wilson worked with the Secretary of State George Marshall and Republican Senator Arthur Vandenberg to get bipartisan support, which didn't ex also exist for the Treaty of Versailles, crucially, um, that they create an investment in peace. They rebuilt not only our allies, but also our enemies as a way of winning the peace, of stabilizing the gains that were made, about acting as a bulwark against the expansion of communism, to be sure. But they got the American people on a bipartisan basis to support an investment in peace. It's the opposite of reparations, and it helps secure the peace in Europe for the last, you know, re really until a few months ago. And so I think one of the things that's happened is that, you know, we, we have been in danger of taking our democracy for granted in recent years. I think we've woken up to the fact we can't afford to do that now. I think Putin's invasion of Ukraine has reminded us why we can't afford to take for granted the peace, the peace that was created by America and its allies after the Second World War because we were committed to winning the peace and the international institutions that were created for that purpose. So the, 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 the ultimate irony is that Lincoln's vision was vindicated after the Second World War. Um, and, and his ideas were finally implemented. It's a great effect. Some good questions here. Oh, good, I like those. From the audience. Um, you might want to hold up your book because it says, tell us the story of the cover of your book. Ah, I love that. Okay, so here's the cover of the book. I love this portrait. It is by N.C. Wyeth who is a famous portraitist illustrator and the, and the father of Andrew Wyeth. Um, it is from a calendar uh, made for the John C. Hormel Meatpacking Company <laughs> in 1940. The calendar was called The Making of America, and this, the, the, the John C. Morrell uh, was, was a, a far-sighted guy who loved American history, I gather, and commissioned this calendar as a promotion vehicle and had N.C. Wyeth do the illustrations, the paintings. And they're scenes from American history. And, you know, there's one of you know, Jefferson uh, writing the Declaration by candlelight, and there are wagon trains coming out west. And, and this is December. And 
it's, it's sort of the apotheosis of, of Lincoln in an elemental state, but it's called With Malice Toward None. So it's his imagination of Lincoln writing the second inaugural. But as, as you can see in, in the picture, um, it's also Lincoln is, you know, there's storm clouds in the back. And the question for a calendar that was going to be viewed by people in December of 1940, and the war had already started in Europe, America hadn't joined yet, is whether the storm clouds are approaching or receding. Um, but the mere fact that when I saw that, I said, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the, the picture for this. And uh, securing the rights where it was a, a, a complicated situation because the John C. Hormel Meat Company no longer exists. But uh, the University of Iowa at Ames and other people were very good. So I love the cover and I appreciate the question. Yeah. During your research, what I, was the most surprising thing you learned? What's that? What was the most surprising thing you learned during your research? Um, I wasn't surprised because I'd seen the quote from, from Lucius Clay, but the way that Lincoln is such a continuous presence in the psyche of people at Versailles and after the Second World War. I mean, the, you know, George Clemenceau, the French prime minister, had actually been a reporter as a young man in America covering Reconstruction. David Lloyd George grew up in a house in Wales that had a picture of Lincoln over the mantelpiece. Um, I was also surprised at, at, um, at, at Lincoln's, I think most people don't think of Lincoln as a constantly joking character. He seems very grave. Um, but he was. I mean, he told jokes all the time and stories all the time, and to the point where, again, people were you know, almost annoyed by it. He was telling jokes all at inappropriate moments. But to realize how tortured he was and that his humor was a form of self-medication, there's a story by Isaac N. Arnold, who comes up to the White House after the Union has lost a, a devastating battle in 1862. And he's going to see his friend. He goes up to the second floor and sees Lincoln sitting alone by a fireplace. Uh, and he's reading a book of one of his favorite humorists, Artemis Ward, and he's laughing. And Arnold, lays into his friend and says, how can you be laughing at a time like this? And then according to Arnold's memoir, Lincoln looks at him and he throws down the book and turns to him with eyes welling up with tears and says, don't you understand that if I could not find some relief, my heart would break. And, and so the way he consciously uses humor and storytelling, uh, humor is a, a form of self-medication for him. That I think is, is more deep in his characteristic and more profound than I appreciated or expected. Another audience question. If you could ask President Lincoln a question, one question, what would it be? That's an interesting question. I've never had that. I mean, my, my first impulse is, is to always make it a dark joke. You know, uh, you know, couldn't you have insisted on better security at the theater? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I would He, he really didn't want to go to the theater. Um, I have a ton of questions about his relationship with Mary. Um, I mean, he didn't think he was going to be assassinated, but he had a whole file full of, uh, you know, I, I, look, getting to spend four years with Lincoln and writing this book and researching this book is such a privilege and a pleasure because he really doesn't disappoint as a human being. Um, and honestly, I would just want to spend time with him. I'd probably ask him about the composition of, of the second inaugural, maybe of Gettysburg. But he, he, even, even among his contemporaries, the, the essence was that he combined greatness with goodness. And it was his goodness that made him really great. So we've come to the point in the program where we only have time for one more Oh, question. no, okay. And an audience member asked the question that I was going to ask, so. Kismet. How can we apply Lincoln's ideas to help address the deep divisions within our country today? That is the big question. Um, first of all, I think we should let ourselves off the hook and people say, you know, are we gonna find another Lincoln? That's, I think, the, not the right question. You know, we're not gonna find another Lincoln precisely. But we can find and look for people of a similar spirit. And it's Lincoln's commitment to reconciling leadership, focusing on elevating our common humanity, focused on empathy, empathizing with your opponents as a means of reasoning with them, on honesty, on using humor as a communication tool to disarm your opponents, and a sense of moral humility, of balancing that moral courage with moderation, 
about thinking about how to achieve sustainable change, about practicing the politics of the golden rule, treating other people as you'd like to be treated, but also knowing there's no substitute for victory. You know, Lincoln believes that the politics, that, that, that pra decency can be the most practical form of politics, but he knows that people are more likely to listen to reason when they're greeted from a position of strength. It's that balance of strength with mercy um, that I think makes Lincoln's leadership still so revolutionary and still so inspiring. And so what we need to do is find people of a similar spirit, of a reconciling spirit, who know how to balance moral courage with moderation uh, and to create sustainable change. It still offers us, I think, a path away from violent polarization, that kind of leadership. Um, and we must, you know, the, the dogmas of the stormy present are not equal uh, to, to the task we have before us. And so I think Lincoln's leadership retains uh, an enormous amount of wisdom that can inspire us through our difficult times. And it really gets to the heart of why we need to study Civil War history, or any history. Um, the Civil War reminds us that we've been through far worse before. We'll get through this. But that when we feed our worst impulses, rather than our better angels, when we default to these tribal visions of our politics, that that's a very dangerous game to play. And I do think that in a nation that is based upon not a tribal identity, but an ideal, we need to tell the stories of our history to create that common construct, to strengthen it again. And the second founding does that for us. In the last speech, after, in the speech Lincoln gave after his reelection, which is the epigraph to the book, um, he says, I'll read it so I get it exactly right. He says, human nature will not change. In any future great national trial, compared with the men of this, we shall have as weak and as strong, as silly and as wise, as bad and as good. Let us therefore study the incidents of this as philosophy to learn wisdom from, and none of them as wrongs to be revenged. That's a pretty obscure Lincoln quote, but I think it might be my favorite. He's talking about himself in an eyes of history, the present moment with the eyes of history. He's talking about the wisdom we can all learn from applied history, about taking people off the pedestal and realizing that in the past and the present that we have silly and strong, you know, weak and wise. And that it's our job as citizens of a self-governing republic to study our history as incidents to learn wisdom from, and none of them as wrongs to be revenged. And when we approach our history from a sense of resentment and grievance, that's how wars never really end. But when we think about it as being part of a chain, a continuum from the past, when we can draw on that wisdom by looking at people eye to eye, not putting them up on a pedestal or looking down at them for being imperfect, that that's where, that's where those are the mystic chords of memory that Lincoln spoke of. That's the continuity that I think can elevate our gaze and, and, and awaken us to the deeper responsibility we have uh, to perpetuate the United States of America, mm -hmm. the Democratic Republic, which we love. Thank you for that. Thank you. Our thanks to John Avalon, author of Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, for joining us today. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of John's book here or at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club efforts in making virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. I'm John Boland. Thank you, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.